Hi there, this is Gloria Hacks with Remax and the Gloria Sells Real Estate Team. Thank you for joining us today for our channel, South Florida Real Estate Tips. Today I'm super excited to introduce you to Elena Schlendova, and she is going to be going over some tips on preparing yourself legally for buying and selling real estate. So hang on. My name is Yelena Sverdlova, um, and I'm an attorney licensed in Florida, Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. And I, my law practice is in Fort Lauderdale. So I actually have been uh, practicing for just about 13 years. Um, and my practice areas are uh, mostly transactional, which is estate planning, business law, uh, real estate, probate, um, uh, buy and sell of businesses, and just anything that really involves contracts and uh, written documents. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. So um, I understand that you were also teaching at FAU. Tell us a little bit more about what were you, what were you teaching at FAU? At Florida Atlantic University, so I am actually currently teaching contract law. Uh, since, 2000, about, since about 2016, I have been teaching real property law and contract law for the paralegal program. So they have a program um, that's a certificate program that is specifically geared towards paralegals. And essentially, in 2016, I started with the contract law class and then I was asked to teach the real property law class as well, which uh, recently I, I stepped back just, just for, uh, for time reasons. Okay, excellent. So, specifically related to real estate law, what are some of the biggest things that a buyer should be concerned with when purchasing a property? So as far as the purchase of a property for a buyer, um, so that's a great question. The first part in the process, so obviously we have a contract. Uh, once the contract is in place, the first thing a buyer needs to be aware of or needs to do is inspections. Um, so definitely uh, it would be very important to have a great inspection company that you know, can come out to the property as soon as possible. So that way they can uh, prepare a report that essentially um, details all of the issues or all of the um, uh, concerns that or repairs that the inspector finds. Uh, what I like to ask is for the inspector to check certain areas in the house for elevated moisture. And the reason why I like to ask that is even though that inspector is not gonna do a mold inspection, they can essentially, if there's no, they can alert you as to whether maybe there was a leak somewhere or whether or not there, you know, you should get a separate mold inspection or a termite inspection. So I also ask to make sure that they look for termites. Um, so that's, you know, that's the first uh, really uh, big aspect or uh, concern that a buyer should be aware of. And then from there, uh, once you have this report, it's, uh, you can always, and I always try to ask that the inspector um, prepares a list of how much each repair will cost. Not every inspector will do this because it takes time and it's, it's for them, you know, they have so many inspections. So definitely maybe that's one thing that you can ask ahead of time. So, you know, will you prepare a list of, you know, what the approximate um, cost for each repair is so that when you go back to the seller, you can negotiate uh, more effectively. From there, so once you've negotiated and let's say you're ready to move forward with the contract, um, next is your financing. So you want to make sure if you're not purchasing in cash, you want to make sure that you're doing everything possible to move the financing along with your lender and uh, it, it, in, ensuring that you meet that financing contingency date in the actual contract. So in the contract, there's a date that stipulates when you can cancel the contract 
in the event you do not have financing approved. So if you miss that deadline, unfortunately what happens is you waive that contingency, meaning that however you need, however you close, you can continue with financing or you have to bring cash to the table. Uh, worst case, if uh, you don't close, unfortunately, what happens is you can potentially lose your deposit, which is devastating for a lot of uh, home buyers. And then uh, other items to be concerned with is the title search. So are there any title issues with the property? Um, is there anything, uh, for example, that, you know, is, does the, does the owner have the proper title? It, and in some cases, when the title search comes back, there may be um, issues for such as a probate is necessary, which is the um, legal transfer of the property to appropriate heirs. So when an individual passes in their, with property in their individual name, it doesn't automatically get distributed to their heirs. Um, in, in most cases, you, to, for that to be accomplished, you would need to have the property held in trust or via a ladybird or enhanced life estate deed. So tell us about the ladybird, because I keep hearing a lot about a ladybird trust here in Florida. Sure. Um, so as far as uh, the options to ensure that a property does not enter probate upon death, there's two options. You can have a revocable or you can establish a revocable trust, which essentially has terms inside the trust of who would receive the asset in the event of, of a passing. And that property would be transferred or deeded into that trust. Uh, a more simpler approach, which usually I, I recommend and I, I see it working a lot better with older individuals. It's what's called a ladybird deed or more formally uh, enhanced life estate deed. Uh, there's only a few states that allow or have provisions for this type of deed. But the great thing about the deed is that it's more simple. Um, it's essentially there's not a large trust document that's established with it. Uh, the and the deed within itself names certain individuals that will be beneficiaries of the property in the event that the owner passes. During your lifetime, you can make any changes to the deed or and do anything with regards to the property that you prefer. The downside is that it's not as flexible as a trust. A trust, you can name contingent beneficiaries, you can name you know, 10 um, levels of beneficiaries, whereas in a deed, you really only have those initial beneficiaries that you name in, within that document. Can somebody who is named in a ladybird trust sell your property? So a beneficiary of a uh, enhanced life estate deed, so, or a ladybird deed, um, cannot. So there's provisions within that deed that allow the owner who is the grantor to have all of the power and the control of the property that you would have had if it was in your individual name. And, and that's why it's a special type of deed that is not, not essentially allowed in every state because there's special laws that, that permit this type of deed to exist. What are some things that homeowners can do um, to prevent the property from going into a probate? Sure, so just like we mentioned, so the, the one, the biggest, the biggest thing that you can do is execute estate planning. So via and transfer the property either into a trust or um, execute a ladybird deed or enhanced life estate deed and add beneficiaries onto the property. Uh, pro uh, another option that I wouldn't necessarily recommend because you would lose some of your power or ability to manage the property is perhaps adding a joint owner. So for example, um, adding a child or an heir onto the property as a joint owner, which again, I don't necessarily recommend this. Another question we have, if someone is a seller 
and they're thinking about selling their home, what are some of the legal issues they must be aware of as part of selling their home? So the great news for sellers is that there's less legwork, we'll say, as long as there's no title issues, um, if the seller is, you know, properly owns the property and there's no probate issues or um, issues with regards to the title. Um, I would say the biggest, um, or at least the first um, issue or the first uh, concern for a seller is whether or not they're required to pay for the title insurance, which is interesting um, in Florida. So in Broward and Miami, the custom is that the buyer pays for the title insurance and chooses the title company that essentially uh, moves forward the transaction to closing. In every other county, including Palm Beach, it's the seller. Uh, however, that can also be varied or changed via contract. So in that real estate contract, it's really the choice of the parties. How, but mo in most cases, that is that is the custom and that, that is what you normally would see. Would I be in trouble if I were a seller and I didn't disclose that there was a leak at some point in my roof? Yes, so disclosures are absolutely extremely important. There is an actual uh, a real estate form that where you would, it's about just about four pages where you would disclose all of the issues with the property. If you don't reside in the property, for example, it's an investment property, in most cases, you can you can answer the um, questions as I don't know and indicate that it is not um, seller occupied. And in that case, obviously, you can't attest to the, um, the the condition of the property. And from there, then the buyer's inspection would would provide the buyer everything that they would need to know regarding any issues with the property. Does a homeowner have to disclose if someone passed away in the home? So in Florida, luckily, um, the actual Florida Senate um, specifies that there is no disclosure requirement in the event that the homeowner knows or suspects of either a death, a suicide, or a homicide in a home in Florida or any property in Florida. In other states, the answer could be a little bit different though. Okay, what about ghosts? That's a great question as well. Um, so interestingly enough, in four states, uh, the homeowner actually does have a requirement to disclose uh, whether Casper has haunted their house, which is not Florida, luckily for us. Um, however, it, it is required in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and I believe Minnesota. All right, awesome. Can somebody name a minor as an owner of real property? It's a great question. The answer is yes. So there's a, there's absolutely no laws that prohibit a minor to be named as a beneficiary of a property outright, so meaning in a deed. The issue, the major issue with it, is that in the event that that person passes, uh, that minor can't do anything with the property until they're at the age of majority, which is 18. So essentially, and essentially it could cause the property to be subject to a minor guardianship. The better way to approach that is to have the property in trust. And that way, the trust will own the property for the benefit of the minor until the minor is at, at the very least 18. Okay, so I have another question for you. Can an owner pass their property on to their pet? That's a great question as well. So unfortunately in Florida uh, and in most states are furry loved ones um, and in other cases are spiky loved ones as I actually have a hedgehog myself. Uh, they are considered personal property. Now there are pet trusts 
that can be established on their behalf. However, the trustee named in that pet trust, you really have to be comfortable that they're gonna do everything with regard to you know, your wishes that you prefer. Because what happens is that in the event that trustee does not follow the trust, the pet obviously has no way to object. Um, and then most, uh, I would say the most common um, situation that I, I've recently learned is Gunther, uh, the German Shepherd that essentially has has millions, if not billions, and just purchased property in Miami recently, which is an amazing story. True. Yes, and there's actually a Netflix documentary about that if anybody is interested in checking that out. Fabulous. So our audience here with the um, South Florida real estate tips, we want to know more about what are some of the things that we need to be aware of, for example, with buy and sell documents? Sure. So the purchase and sale of a business um, typically entails um, essentially somebody has a business and then another person comes in and they, uh, they uh, desire to purchase a business. Sometimes it, it uh, transpires in a uh, more internal setting where there's a successor, an older partner, and a younger partner or one of the employees, for example, um, would like to succeed as the owner. Um, and then in other cases, you have your third party purchaser that comes in and you're just interested really in, in selling the business. Um, one of the first decisions that um, you would have to uh, make is whether you're selling the assets of the business or whether you're selling the actual stock or the actual membership interest of the business. Um, essentially, the best to the extent that it's possible is to sell the assets of the business. So where you purchase the assets of a business, the great thing is that the liability that has accrued prior to the sale doesn't follow the asset. So to the extent possible, you would prefer or it prefer that um, you would sell or purchase the assets of the business. Um, where you have to purchase the stock or the membership interest of the business, while the liability does follow, in some cases, you're essentially, um, you're essentially there's no other option. And in those cases, uh, that's usually where maybe there's a landlord that does not want to consent to a sale. Maybe there's a lot of assets, for example, um, a, a, a ton of uh, trucks. So it's a trucking company where to retitle or change the owner on those assets is just extremely overwhelming and cumbersome. In that case, you can also limit your liability uh, through either, it, through both indemnification and also you can hold back some of the purchase price in escrow for a number of years. So in case there's any liability that accrues, you have that money set aside for the number of years and you know essentially that would go to a pay for that liability. Okay, wonderful. That's good information. So is there are there any other tips that you want to give our viewers? I would say the single most uh, best tip is if you're using a realtor, make sure to use someone who's very knowledgeable and you know absolutely educates you as to the process. And with a wonderful realtor like Gloria right here, uh, the process becomes so much easier and there's so many less issues that arise. How can people contact you? So you can contact me via my website. So it's capital planning law.com or you may call me directly um, on 754-444-1442. And it's been an absolute pleasure being here and I hope that I uh, answered everybody's questions. Are you on socials? Absolutely. If you uh, search my name, Yelena Sverdlova, you'll find plenty of resources, including social media. Well, there you have it. Elena is a excellent resource for information on helping us understand the legalities of purchasing and selling 
real estate. So thank you for joining us for the channel today. If you like what you saw, I hope you'll give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Mm -hmm.